Hello, everyone. It's Bradford Speaks, host of the Everything Matters podcast, founder, CEO, managing director, and head coach of BeLegendary.Coach, where we transform leaders into legends. My special guest today on the Everything Matters podcast is a longtime friend of mine, someone I'm very proud to call my friend, and his name is Robert M. Fields II. Robert is a Christian, a committed family man, and a member of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, and currently works as Chief Financial Officer for a company located in the Atlanta area. During this interview, I was able to fill in a lot of gaps about things that I didn't know about Robert. I didn't know that he's a military veteran, grew up in Washington, D.C., met his wife there while living in the Alabama area. He earned his college degree while working full time. Robert is also among a very elite group of people who hold the designation of certified public accountant. Robert was also the first African-American who would hold the position of president of the Educational Foundation of Georgia's Society of CPAs. Please join me in welcoming my guest, my friend, my brother, Robert M. Fields II to the Everything Matters podcast. Let's get it popping. What's going on, man? How you doing today, brother? So great to have you on the podcast, bro. Thank you, my brother. It is good. It is good to be here. Thank you for the invite. Appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. So great to catch up with you. It's been a it's been a minute since yes. I've seen you since we've been able to really connect, right? So uh just being able to reconnect, man, after so many years. And, and the way that we reconnect. Yeah. I love LinkedIn, man. It's a beautiful thing, you know. Something <laughs> social That's media in general. The reason why I got on it. <laughs> 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 right. It was, it was like it's a great way. People that you haven't talked to in a while, you know, all of a sudden they pop up in your feed and it's like, oh, man, shit, man, I ain't talked to Robert in a long time. I'll check on him, see how he's doing. So how you <laughs> right. been, man? I've been great. I've been great. I got to admit, though, I do have a bone to pick with you, though, because uh, I'm losing hair and you grain in here. So I, other than that, I'm good with you. I'm good. I'm going to get over that. Hey, but, you know, <laughs> but Rob, you know what, though? I do have a little gray, though, bro. So, no, no. If, that, if that makes you feel any better, bro, I got some gray in there. Well, I need to talk to some people then because I got, oh, <laughs> it's probably, you wisdom, know, we're right? ta- yeah, that, that is, man. And we're going to talk about some wisdom today, man. So, so again, brother, thank you for coming on to the show, man, and for accepting the invitation and, and, and being willing to share your story, man. So, yeah. Rob, I, I normally start out with, uh, with sort of going back to people's background and we're going to get to that. I know you're a DC cat, you know, so I want people to know where you're from and, and where you went from there and that kind of thing. But I really want to start this show off giving people a sense of who you are. And one of the stories that you share with me uh, off camera uh, was um, about one morning you were at a Wendy's restaurant and there's a gentleman that came into the restaurant. And, and I'd love for you to just try to walk us through that whole scenario, what that was. And this really gives people a sense of who you are as a human being, man. So please share that with us. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, that's a story I would say definitely defines my life, I would say. And it's because um, people are people. And I think we judge people sometimes too prematurely the wrong way. Um, yeah. Actually, I was with a good friend of mine. We were down south of Atlanta and uh, we were doing some errands. And then we stopped at a Wendy's for a, a early lunch. We sat mm-hmm. there. We had a good time. It was in the fall. It was a pretty cold day. And we sat there and ate, had a great time, went and uh, was about to leave the restaurant. And as we were leaving, there was this uh, older gentleman, uh, black mm-hmm. guy was sitting inside the restaurant, standing in front of the door rather. And he was cold. You can tell he was cold. He was inside trying to just keep warm. Mm-hmm. And if you looked at him close enough, you can tell he was living on the street. So it was no doubt. Mm-hmm. And as I walked by, I always try to just say good morning to people. So I said, hello, good morning. And he was very nice and cordial, said hello. And then I could tell something wasn't right. And I just asked him plain out, are you hungry? And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm hungry. But you know, he shook his head. He was kind of scared to speak. And I told him, come with me. And so he followed me hesitantly. I said, no, come with me. And I, I walked him over and it was a long line. It was lunchtime at Wendy's. And when we came over there, he kind of, I told him to get in the line and he went and stood by the wall. And I said, no, 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 you, you get in line. And he went and got in line and I went around the line and went and asked for the manager. And when the manager came around, 
I gave her $20 and I told her this man right here, give him whatever he wants. This entire $20 mm-hmm. is all his. Give him whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. And I looked over and he was just smiling. And then you could see the manager. She had a great smile. People were smiling. And then even other people in the line were looking at me kind of like, wow, like I can't believe this is going on. Right. And I walked by, right. shook his hand and said, you have a blessed day. And then me and my friend walked out. I didn't stay around to see what else came of that. It wasn't about me trying to get accolades. This was about a right. man who was hungry and was trying to stay warm. And twenty dollars is not a lot of money in the scheme of things when you're putting food in someone's stomach. So I say right. that to say that if we were to just do small acts of kindness like that every day to someone who you can tell is in need, imagine where this world would be. We don't know what caused him to be in that situation. So who is it for me That's to right. judge? So true, man. So true. You know, there, there's a lot of, and I just really acknowledge you, man, for stepping up and having the courage, you know, because a lot of times we won't do it because it's like, you know, what, what, what are the other people going to say about me? Like, what are they going to think? Or, you know, or is he going to, you know, there's been times where, you know, we have all experienced this where you may give a homeless person something on the street and they may take it and go buy liquor with it or go buy dope with it. Right. Right. And, you know, it's like, you're kind of caught in this quagmire sometimes. Like I really, I really want to help, but if I'm driving my car and you're on the corner, I don't know what you're going to do with that money. And there's stories where people are paying handlers <laughs> that make a lot of money on an annual basis, just doing that. Right. Do. So I think the situation, the way you handled it, man, you saw a need, you made a contribution to that gentleman and you made sure he got what he needed that morning. Cause obviously the guy was hungry. So, yes. you know, I appreciate you sharing that story. And I think that's a, a great way to start the the conversation because I know you're someone and always have been someone since the, the entire time I've known you, which is probably, man, I'm going to say close to 20 years now, <laughs> close to 20 years now. It's been a minute, you know? Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Dog. No doubt. You know, but you've always been that kind of a person that just, you know, will give, give someone a shirt off your back, man. And, and, and those are the things that, that I want to highlight in you and for every guest that comes onto the podcast. So thank you for that, man. Thank you. Great. Yeah. My pleasure. So, let, let's back up a little bit, you know, so now we know who Robert Fields is, you know, and uh, I mentioned earlier that you grew up in D.C. So talk about, you know, where you grew up in D.C., what that was like for you, how you ended up coming to Atlanta. You know, you met you met your beautiful wife in in, in Alabama, you know, so we got to hear we got to hear what that's like. You know, you come from D.C. to Alabama. Man, what was that like? So talk about that growing up in D.C. I'm still dealing with that. Um <laughs> I grew up in the PG County area, um, graduated from Potomac High School in Oxon Hill, Maryland. Um, okay. A lot of great people came out of that school and, and in the Prince George's County area. And um, I decided to join the military. I know I needed to get ahead. I wanted to go somewhere and be something in my life. And we didn't have the financial means. I didn't grow up the, the best. Um, it wasn't mm-hmm. the worst, but it definitely wasn't the best. So I had sure. to find a way to provide myself for college. And so I joined the Army Uh and then when I joined the military, I had basic training, graduated. <laughs> I remember my mother and family members came. And that's when I found out that they were sending me to Alabama. And that's when my mother cried. And I think I cried, too. We we're like, where is Alabama? Wow. Like, where is Alabama? <laughs> uh, <Right. laughs> it was one of those things. Um, but it changed my life forever. Um, mm. I was a nuclear weapons technician, believe it or not, in the military. I used okay. to fix nuclear weapons for a living. And wow. um, long story short, I, I served my term during Desert Storm, traveled mm-hmm. a few places here and there. But what I did, though, while I was in is I knew I wanted to go through college and I used the military to my advantage. I went to school during lunch. I went to school at night while everybody else was out partying and doing their things. Um, I was focused on getting my degree and I was able to get two associate degrees, both with honors while I was in the military. And I wow. saved up enough cash. And then when I got out, um, I went to University of Alabama in Huntsville and got my degree in accounting. And um, then I went to work for Arthur Anderson. I got an offer in Birmingham at their Birmingham office, okay. my junior year of college. Okay. And so um, that was a struggle in itself, um, just getting myself notarized and recognized uh, yeah. to get to a big six accounting firm at the time. But mm-hmm. I got the job. I started and then I went to the airport to pick up a client. Um, and I was, I was at the airport, the Birmingham airport. There was this. There was this woman sitting there at the airport, mm. the terminal. And I knew Man, I saw I her who that was. <laughs> she was. She wasn't Holly Berry. She was a little bit better at that time. She was much better <laughs> there you than go. Holly Berry at that time. Um, no, but yeah, right. I went and sat down next to her. We talked. We exchanged numbers. And uh, next thing you know, we went on a date. And it was fast forward from wow. there. Wow. The rest been, is history, um, man. 25 years. 
25 years. Wow, dude, 25 years. Congratulations, man. Yes. Thank you. So when I met you, y'all hadn't been married that long. Y'all were still kind of newlyweds when I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah still That's newlyweds. Awesome, man. Outstanding, bro. Outstanding, man. So congratulations on that, bro. It, it, it's you. not easy to make a relationship, particularly a marriage work and raising kids. It, it's it's mm-hmm. a challenge. It, it's not yeah. easy. I'll say that. Right. So no, that's no, awesome, bro. It's it's so, awesome. yeah, it is. It is. So you joined the military. So was the military intentionally to be able to take advantage and leverage the, the funding from the military to go to college? Was that the intention? That's a great question. Yes, it was, actually. Um, OK, I would tell you. Um, if I may, I have this firm belief that you have to know where you want to go in life. You may not know exactly what it is. You can't define it, but you have some kind of general idea. So I knew at a young age, I wanted to be a businessman. My father was a businessman and I knew I wanted to Mm -hmm. be in business. I loved numbers. I loved talking to people. I loved making things happen. And so Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to do that. And so I worked my way backwards to figure out what steps can I take to get to that goal. And I knew the military would be a great conduit to get me there by allowing me to go to school, by allowing me to save some money and allowing me to use that to go to school to get that degree. Outstanding. So w- tell us about your dad, man. Like what, what kind of a businessman was he? What did he do? Oh, oh my father. Um, he, he's, he's amazing. Um, I have to admit mm. he's amazing. From a very young age, I recall um, my father was in banking. And mm-hmm. as he was in banking, he worked for a bank and he got into the mortgage side of business. And he was really upset because he would see deals get passed up that they wouldn't take um, any um, calculated risk on or helping others. Mm-hmm. And it bothered him so much that he decided to open mm-hmm. his own business. And so he okay. left the bank and opened up his own mortgage company and it's called Reality Mortgage. And he just skyrocketed. And what I liked wow. about him was he decided that he wanted to not just take this company, but he brought people along with him and he built this company and he didn't do just mortgage. He got into the real estate industry. Okay. And I recall when he was with a real estate firm learning and getting his license, he was in a room full of, he was the only minority, let's say in the room mm-hmm. and everybody had to take turns speaking about what they did, what deals were on the table, et cetera. And I remember as a little kid, it was so boring just listening. But then when it was his turn <laughs> to speak, he commanded the room. He stood mm. up. He was excited, energetic, and everybody just was gravitated to him. And that's when I knew I wanted to do what my father was doing. And ever since then, he continued to do that. He's a very successful businessman. He's now retired. He grew a, a, an amazing business, a huge portfolio. He's blessed so many people. He's a minister of the gospel. And so I love to hear him speak and and wow. uh, and bless people with the word. And that's, that's what I've I want to model myself after in the sense that I can use what I do every day to bless people. It's a gift from God. And that's how my father saw himself as a gift of God to bless people with um, the ministry and the word, but also with his business, because, you know, he wasn't out trying to snatch every single dollar. He was out there trying to put people in homes or help this church find a new church building. So that's, that's what, actually model i model after that's what i wanted to do and be and that's 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 the end result for me yeah dude i i I didn't i didn't know that story uh about your pops man that's awesome uh you know obviously he had a huge impact on who you became as a as a man i would i would also assert as a father as a husband i mean as Mm -hmm. who you are in life right as someone who's contributing and wants to contribute to other people and make a difference with other people so outstanding man kudos kudos to pops for that man You mentioned a second ago about mortgage and finance and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's ironic that you and I met in, in the real estate industry was, Mm -hmm. was, was his background in real estate and and having worked in that area of uh, a business, was that something that inspired you to go into that area? Yes, actually that's, that's true statement. Um, Growing up in real estate with him, uh, I became fond of it. And so, yes, most of my background has been in the construction market, whether it been residential where you and I were. Um, the mm-hmm. commercial side where I worked in commercial investments, um, worked at a HVAC company for a while as their uh, director of finance and then con- uh, concrete industry. And now I'm in a commercial management company. So I love it. You mentioned earlier that you cut your teeth sort of in the financial world at Arthur Anderson, which at the time was a big six accounting firm, which is a huge accomplishment for someone fresh out of college to be able to land something at one of those firms. I know that's a huge accomplishment. There's so many different realms of, of finance that people can can go into. Right. So 
And from my understanding, you're you've done a little bit of portfolio investment, you know, and you've done some. And right now you're working as a CFO. So give us a kind of a broad stroke, if you would, if you would, of, you know, that role that you took. I know that brought you to Atlanta. That was more of of, uh, investment management, Mm -hmm. portfolio management. And then now what and then what you moved on to going to Syntex, becoming the assistant controller there and from there. So give us an idea of what what those different roles are like and what they entail. OK, great. No, thank you. Um, in accounting, I know going through college, I had to determine exactly where I want. And I found out that in accounting, you have two sides. You have the public and you have the private. And public right. is where you really can really grind your teeth and really learn about um, business and get the best training possible, I think, in some aspects. So, yes, I started at Arthur Anderson, started off as like a, a, in the audit side, um, doing okay. audits for other companies like um, the Alabama Kidney Foundation, for example, and okay. others, nonprofit, retail, et cetera. And I learned so much to Arthur Anderson in public accounting, but it is a long grind. You're working hard, long hours. Mm meeting with companies and their deadlines. But then I decided to go into the public, I mean, the private sector, out of public into the private sector. And so that's when I started working for some other companies in the Birmingham area. But then I wanted to get back into real estate. And that's when my wife Mm. and I, not long after we were married, uh, agreed to move to Atlanta. Um, And that's where I got my CPA license in in, uh, in Atlanta, excuse me. Okay. And when I got to Atlanta, I went to work for a firm called TMW, and they're a commercial okay. real estate firm, which is dear to me, as I mentioned earlier, real estate. And mm-hmm. there I managed portfolios. And so we had foreign investors investing in U.S. real estate, class A commercial mm-hmm. buildings, and we would manage their portfolios for them and mm-hmm. make sure they're making that return that they wanted, of course. And so nice. um, from that perspective, I went from audit to working in um, a private sector where I'm overseeing portfolio and accounting, um, monitoring bank accounts and the revenue and small P&L financial statements for them. It was great. And then you can move up. Um, there's so much that a person can do in that. You can do bookkeeping, you can do tax, you can do audit, you can do internal audit. Um, lots, most people do a lot of consulting work. And if you're really, mm. really trying to make a career, I encourage you to become a CPA, which gives you training in all facets of, of the accounting spectrum. And so um, I've been blessed that, yes, right now um, I am the CFO of, of a great company here called Argo Systems. And um, again, still in the real estate construction commercial side of things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. That's your love, man. Yeah, that's your love, man. It's your passion. It's awesome. So um, so that, that gives really, you know, really a, a, a keen sense, I think, of what the finance world is like. You know, me not being a big numbers guy, you know, I pay somebody like you to manage my whatever little bit I got. Right. right. <laughs> right? It's just not my thing. And, and I'm OK with that. I'm more of a creative artsy. You know, I'm, you know, that's who I am. And that's that's fine. We need all of us in the world to make it all work. You know, so um, I want to step back a moment, you know, because I can't let you get away from here knowing that you went to Alabama. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know, man. You know, I'm a, I'm a Louis. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Louis. Uh, you and Nicole, we're going to have issues next time we go out to dinner, bro. <laughs> I'm a Louisiana boy to the heart, man. You know, we, yes, you there's, there's, there's a love hate, man. We got with you guys, but uh, that's awesome. So, you know, Alabama, you know, not to throw your age out there, but Alabama wasn't quite what it is today back then, right? You know, there was no, there was no Nick Saban. There was no, consistent national championships, but obviously academically, they were still pretty strong. What was the experience like for you attending Alabama, University of Alabama? Well, um, I actually attended University of Alabama in Huntsville, which was a, a spinoff of Tuscaloosa, um, but, it, but it was great nonetheless. Um, what I loved about the school is that um, a lot of it was fake focused towards engineering and nursing, and the business department wasn't that strong at the time. But I became so active that um, from the very first semester, because, again, my thought is I had to figure out what it needed to do to get to the final goal. What was my Mm -hmm. final goal in life? And so while I was at that school, I joined every club and organization that they offered. I helped them to grow. I met with um, professors who became mentors for me. Um, Mm -hmm. The other students and colleagues around, we spent a lot of time together trying to sharpen each other up. It was a great culture and atmosphere. And that I don't think you have to go to any big name school to to get that. Yeah, we go to places and thinking about you give me this, you give me that. But you'd be amazed at what you can get when you give. 
And so I think the time that I invested in those things propelled me to be where I'm at. Yeah. Outstanding, man. Outstanding. And I I think you're absolutely correct. You know, I went to a small school in Louisiana too, and, Mm -hmm. and made some, uh, some wonderful relationships with with guys and, and ladies that I still, you know, and when I looked at my, I look at my LinkedIn profile, I've got a network there, right. Of people who I went to school with that, work at certain companies and something happens and say, Hey, you know, Hey, I know you're over at that company over there with, with Robert, you know, Hey, can you got anything, you guys got anything open over there training and development, you know, whatever it might be or coaching. So it's, it's what you get. And I think what you put yourself into, what you expose yourself to. Right. And right along those lines, you know, you've been very involved in a lot of different things. You know um, I want you to talk about some of the social organizations. I know you got your pen on there on the, on the camera, Omega sci-fi. I know that's a big part of, you know, um, you know, your college experience. And I know you're still involved with the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, you know, which I want to talk to you more about that as well. And, and just talk to us about some of the things that you're involved in from a from a social sort of giving back perspective around Atlanta and maybe even around the world. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated is a huge part of who I am. Um, been in the fraternity for 26 years now. And wow. I still remain active to this day. Um, I'm serving as the state treasurer uh, for the state of Georgia. And um, I work in a lot of different facets. But Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated is an opportunity to allow me to give back to the community. And that's one of the things I'm most proud about. Um, one of our biggest um, programs that we do at my chapter, Delta Mu Mu, here in Atlanta is we have a Black Rhinos program. It's a mentoring program that we started several years ago and it's continued to grow and grow and grow. Right now we have Mm. approximately 100 young men. Every year we have more and more men, young men trying to join our program. And through fundraising efforts and through our own pockets, the men of this chapter through our own pockets, we give money and we don't take it. No one's on salary, no one's getting paid for it. We're giving of our sweat and equity into this Mm. program so that we can mentor at least 100 young black men through the summer to expose them to things that they otherwise would not have gotten exposed to. And so it makes me proud that I can be able to be um, to support in those kind of efforts. Um, It's just amazing. I really believe that we as a people have to give back. And so Omega Sci Fi Fraternity is is I'm so proud to be an Omega man that can do things like that and, and actually touch the lives of these men directly and not just saying, oh, I gave a dollar. Man, I love it, man. I love it. And, and uh, you know, I didn't pledge. I started out pledging. That's a whole story. Uh, but Omega Sci-Fi, if I was to ever pledge anything, that would be the way I would go. So, uh, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I was, dude, I was, I was an Omega in high school. I, I just, I had guys I looked up to that were Omegas in college that were older than me. And I was like, that's what I want to be right there. But then I, you know, something happened, but that's another, another story we can talk about another time. But also, man, I'm so, so, um, just grateful for the work that you guys are doing, man, as an organization. And uh, it's something that I've thought about as well. Like, how can I contribute to helping a lot of, you know, young men, young black men in particular, mm-hmm. but but young people in general, right? Giving back to our youth is a big part of, of yes. what I think life's about, man. What do you leave? And one of the things that that you talked about um, previously, not in this interview, but we talked about offline mm-hmm. was legacy, right? And the importance of legacy and what that means to you. So give us some insight on, you know, what it means for you to really be a legacy, which is what you're doing. You're creating that now and leaving a legacy for the people that follow not only your own kids, but but, you know, but for the world. man. what do you see that as? I have to say I'm extremely passionate about that. And the reason why is, you know, I've, I've been blessed to go around the sun quite a few years and I've seen myself evolving and 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 seeing things for myself with my own eyes. And it feels like the world's version of legacy is leaving um, materialistic things, these big tangible mm-hmm. items like this bank account or this business and the house. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Don't get me wrong. Right. We have to take care of our children and our children's children. Please don't misunderstand that. But I am a firm believer in that we also have to make sure we're leaving a legacy of how to handle and manage mm-hmm. those things that we're providing for them. And we also have to realize that there are a lot of people in this world who don't have that benefit of receiving those type of things when their prior generations have passed and gone. And so what can I do to not only bless my children and my children's children, but the children of the world? I look at them as all our children. And so for me, leaving a legacy is also 
how can I spend time with individuals to help maybe change mm-hmm. their minds, maybe to help them become stronger than what they are mentally and give them the tools and the trade or whatever I can do to impact their lives? Because impacting one can impact many. And that's where I come in at is that God has blessed me. I, 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 it's nothing that I've done to get to this point where I'm sitting in this chair now mm-hmm. without God. God has ordered my right. steps. God has blessed me through college, blessed me with my MBA, my CPA, a beautiful wife, a home, the children. I got a great opportunity now with the CFO position and I've continued to be blessed. So how do I do that for others? And I do yeah. it through my fraternity. I do it through my own personal efforts where I try to mentor someone, spend time with someone. Um, And if I may, something that I heard from an interview that Denzel Washington did a few Mm -hmm. years back that I've adopted for myself in so many ways is that um, when you think of someone running a race, like a four by four relay, the first person Mm -hmm. starts off running and has this baton and they're running and running. Then when they reach the second person, what happens? That second person starts to run and then that person is reaching behind them for that baton. And person number one is reaching forward with that baton, ready to hand it off. And Mm -hmm. there's a moment in time where both hands are touching that baton. And then when that first person lets go of that baton, what happens? Well, the second person is taken off running. But you know what? That first person didn't just come to a stop. That first person is still running behind that second person, eventually, gradually slowing down. And that's how I look at legacy. Legacy Mm -hmm. is a point where we got to be able to hand it off to somebody but follow them, guide them through it, and then eventually let go, but continue keeping an eye on them and watching them through that. And so for me, that's mentorship. Yes, I've been called, I've gone to places and I've spoken at areas and and I've had a lot of people come and meet me. And yeah, we can all do that and say that's giving back. And it is a form of giving back. We can donate through United Way and, and give to these organizations financially. And yes, that's nothing wrong with that. That's great. I still do that to this day. But if there's an opportunity that we can actually physically touch someone from a point of instilling thoughts and wisdom and guidance, and not just one time, but over a period of time, we'd be amazed at the impact that we could have at someone's life. And so to this day, I went and spoke at an AICPA conference a few years ago. It was for minorities in business and Mm -hmm. finance. And after I spoke and I went in um, and uh, the kids there, the college kids, all gravitated towards people. And this one young lady came, she fought to get to me. And we sat down and we talked. And after that conversation, she made sure she had my name and my phone number, my email. And to this day, we still keep in touch. She's one of my favorite mm-hmm. mentees. Her name is Erica Harrell. And so, so amazed by her. In fact, we, we had a conversation just last night. She was calling to let me know how things are going with her. And it's, our relationship has grown to where I even call her for advice sometimes. It's been right. a blessing. And so the point I'm making is it's not just a one point contact because you'd be amazed. And I guarantee you, Erica is now the type of person where she's doing the same for others. And so, man, no question. That's what it's all about. We can't do life on our own. Um, Even Jesus had disciples with him, praying with him, guiding him and walking him. Why can't we? Why are we any different? Yeah. I agree. It's it's a reciprocal thing. It's a giving and a taking, a giving and a taking. It's just like in a marriage or any kind of relationship, you give some and you take some. And That's you're exactly always right. giving to one. It's a beautiful thing, man. So, bro, I, every time you talk, I just hear about something more amazing that you're doing, man. And I know that you're not about credit for you, but I want to give you acknowledgement, man, because I didn't know that you were doing all these great things and touching all these lives. And that's really what it's about. I love the analogy of the passing the baton, because what you're saying and speaking to is the follow up, right? You just can't give the baton and just say, OK, you're on your own. you got to continue to follow up and continue to steer and guide. And I think a big part of that comes from having people really hear you. Right. And you talk about mentoring people, you know, and what I find that works as a coach when I'm coaching individuals is that to really have people hear you requires that you be vulnerable yourself. You got to be willing to give something of yourself because when people willing to, when people see you willingness to tell the truth about something that you're dealing with, they're going to be more likely to tell the truth about something that they're dealing with. And now we've got a space to work. Now we can actually get somewhere with each other, right? And then grow and, and develop what we want to develop. So really great, man. Really great. So Rob, I want to sort of go back to career. You know, your your your, your life is a mix of career, family giving back and, and, and being a contribution to other people. And I love that. So um, 
it's it, it's a real big deal for and I know you might not want to take this credit, Brad, ain't that about me. You know, it's a really big deal for you as a black man to be in a executive position with a big company. You know, I mean, you know, being promoted to chief financial officer is nothing short of really amazing, you know. So talk to us about, you know, that transition. And I'm not the kind of person that gets into, you know, well, uh, you know, because, dude, you put the work in, period. You deserve it. You earned it. Right. I seen you grind. So I know that you deserve to be where you are. But what's what was the 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 the, the movement like for you? And and when did you know that it was possible that you mm-hmm. could actually be in a chief financial officer position? I would have to say that's a great question, something that I actually just really came to realization about a few years Mm -hmm. ago, honestly. First and foremost, I think for anyone to be in any kind of leadership position, you have to understand what being a leader is about. Mm -hmm. And it was a few years ago that I really came into the knowledge, if you will, of what a true leader is. And for me, that was being a servant leader. And once I started understanding what a servant leader is and started acting like one and being one and being sincere about it, I was developing the trust of those under me and with me and my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that trust built a strong uh, collaboration to be able to to excel as an organization. And then I was able to back off and be more of that leader and direct and guide for success. And by me helping others to be successful, it helped me to be even more successful. It helped me to focus on the bigger picture, the macro level of things. And I forced myself to get out of the weeds of what I was dealing with day to day. I had to learn that Mm -hmm. I can't always be a micromanager, but macro and develop that trust in those. And they shined. I shined. I was able to provide more, if you will, um, guidance and be a business partner to those organization, which helped the organization to grow. Um, A few years ago, I took a role as a director and in that role, in the first three months, I saved the company over $2 million, just like that, wow. from decisions wow. that they were making. And then I was able to call on some colleagues of other firms that I've done business with. They came in, mm-hmm. they do what they do. I managed the processes and we became more efficient. We saved money in so many areas. And I took this organization to new heights. And that's when I realized, Robert, you can do so much more mm-hmm. than this. And I had to get out of my own way. I had to develop that confidence in myself. So as much as I give to others, I had to give to myself and realize that, Robert, you can do so much more and have a bigger impact at a larger scale. And so that's what I said. Nope, it's time. It's time. And so the confidence that I had, the leadership skills that I had, the experience that I had, um, the fact that when I fought to become a CPA years ago, my CPA license is still active to this day. There's less than one percent of minority CPAs in this world. And wow. so I'm not going to give up my active license CPA, not for not for anything. Awesome. And so I say that to say that that's when I realized that I can do more. And so I, I honestly, um, this company through word of mouth and through other, it came about. And so it's a blessing. Yeah, I wanted to ask you also, and we talked a little bit about it offline. Obviously, you've done the work to be where you are. There's no question about that. People who have worked with you in the past and can continue to work with you and have a relationship with you know that you belong where you belong. <laughs> But I talked to some other executives uh, who uh, are minority executives in positions Mm -hmm. such as yourself. And one of the things that they share that they that they dealt with in the very beginning is wondering, man, am I in the right place? I mean, I'm a you know, it's like you it's like you wake up one day. It's Mm -hmm. like I'm a I'm a CEO, like I'm a CFO. You know, one of my buddies, (laughs) you know, we went to college. I went to college with and at Northwestern State. And, uh, you know, he got promoted to CEO the last year. And. You know, and I'm like, this is my room dog. You know, we stayed together. This is, my, you know, I mean, I know his, his mom and dad, like my second mom and dad. And, and to see him rise the ranks like that, I mean, it just fills my heart so much. We hung out a couple of weeks ago and he was coming through Atlanta uh, from the U- UK, visiting his family here in the States. And uh, it's, you know, and I was talking to one of our other buddies and he was like, man, he said, he said, dude, Trey, the CEO. I'm like, I know. And it's just amazing, <laughs> you know. So, but he, but, you know, him and a couple other guys that I know that are executives, you know, especially minority men executives talk mm-hmm. about, you know, when they first got there, it's like, dude, it's like this, it's like, a, it's almost surreal, you know? Yes. Um, and you wonder like, man, you know, okay, you look around and there ain't really nobody looking like you in that, in that, in that boardroom. Right. So what's right. that experience been like for you so far? I know you're relatively new in the role, but 
you know, what's what's that been like for you, even in the directorship role that you've been? I'm sure there's yeah, yeah. a very small percent of minorities there. What's that what's that whole experience been like for you? I have to tell you, Brad, um, I felt like that my entire career. Mm. Right where I'm at now is nothing new for me in how I feel in terms of walking in the room. Um, yeah. As sad as it may sound, it's reality. Um, when I worked at Arthur Anderson in our office, I was the only um, minority professional in that office. Um, mm. We had two other individuals working in, I think, the mail room and someone else was like a, a receptionist um, mm. at the other companies that I've been at. Um, I've been the only person in the boardroom. We'll be in board meetings and I'll sit in the conference room in the board meeting with the board of directors and right. they'll look at me and ask me to take the minutes. And I'm no different than anyone else. Um, unfortunately I've experienced that, um, there's been other companies where I've always been the highest ranking minority in the organization, um, mm. from a, a race perspective, if you will. And so, right. um, it's sad to say that I've been in that position all the time, but there's still one of the things that we did talk about, I mean, I mentioned to you is we are still first, you know, it's 2022, but there's still so many opportunities for us as African American male and females to be a first, um, and yeah. I, I just want to say that I'm a very proud member of the Georgia Society of CPAs, and I was um, president of their educational foundation founded back in the 1950s. And mm. I worked up the ranks when I became president there. I was the first African-American wow. president of that organization. Wow. Um, and so I, I say that to say they're still first to be made. And so, yes, um, being CFO here is a great honor. I'm very, very excited. I give all praises to God. And I did work very hard to get to this point. And so I walk in that door now more confident in who I am and what I can provide because yeah. of those experiences leading up to this, because I've yeah. had to experience that all the way going through. And again, that transformation of realizing I am a leader and I've proven myself time and time again. So I know my worth. And That's so right. I don't go in there looking, um, you know, like I'm timid or scared or afraid, but I go in there being a business partner and trying to help the persons that I work with and work for to help them make this company what it can be. And I'll do that no matter where I am. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And, uh, you know, I think that, and I just want to make sure that whoever is listening that we're, you know, there's no excuse, you know, cause I'm not, and I know Rob, you and I've talked about it, you know, there's no excuse if you're a minority and you're not in an executive role or you're not in a leadership role, there's no excuse. Do the work. Right. The work. And there's a lot of work you can do. I'm a big proponent of coaching. Get you a performance coach that yes. can actually help guide you and give you, you know, uh, advice and help you to create this future that you want for yourself. There's nothing that you can't do. I mean, literally nothing that you can't do. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there's no excuse. I don't, I don't believe in that. Like, you know, when, when you ha when we talk about the civil rights movement, I think that was a, one of the most iconic movements in the world. But there was also some downside to that is that it gave people an excuse to hide behind. You know, when you look at black Americans historical, historically, Rob, like your like your dad, you know, your mom, my parents, bro, they weren't looking for no handouts from nobody. No, no. They got out and got it done. They worked. They had community. They went to church together. They prayed together, stayed together. I mean, that and that built a very strong backbone for black black backbone for blacks in, in America. The yeah. Civil rights movement, you know, by giving some of the handouts that we got through that, I'm not saying that there wasn't a, le a, hand, a, le a, hand, a leg up needed. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But man, by taking that, some people took advantage of it and it, it kind of put us in a spot to where we lost the value of hard work in a, in a, in a big way. And mm -hmm. I think that it's up to people like you and I to bring that back around and put that in our kids and whoever it is that we're mentoring that, hey, there's no limits for you. Right, right. Like literally, say, especially yeah. today, right? Especially yeah. today. I would say yeah. to your point is that the fight is not over. We're still fighting. True. And True. so, yes, we have we, we are able to vote, but they're still pushing us in certain quadrants where we can't vote. They're putting barriers and obstacles. Those barriers right. and obstacles will not go away right away. We have to That's keep right. fighting. They'll continue to put those in our way. So what do we do? We can't just right. fight and stop fighting and just stay where we are. No. Right. And so you're right. The efforts that you are doing with this program and with coaching, you are building individuals up for that fight. What you Absolutely. do is so paramount to help soldiers get to where they need to get. It's no different than in the boxing ring, right? You got to every now and then you got to ring that bell, right. go sit in the corner. And you need somebody to coach you, right? Get, you, right. get, you, get you washed up, ready to go for the next round. That's and right. so, yes, don't get me wrong. We, we did 
do a lot in the civil rights era, but you're right. There's still more to do. We can't oh just God. be complacent where we are. And so forums like what you're providing now, I pray gives other people inspiration and hope to say, look, if you want more, fight for it, fight for it. If you want more for your community, fight for it. Don't just be complacent. There's so much out there that we have to take because they're not going to give it to us. And this, what, what the blessings I have was not given to me by any person in this world. It was God in me forcing and fighting and him directing my steps. But I had to walk. God. God told me where to go, but I had to walk to get there. Right. Man, powerful, bro. Powerful. All right, Rob, brother. Uh, one of the things that we continue to talk to our, uh, our guests about on the Everything Matters podcast is about challenges, because you know as well as I know, you know, you've talked about some of your challenges that you went through climbing the ranks. I yeah. certainly had my my share of challenges climbing the ranks to where I'm at and, and still have challenges to this day. Yes. You know, what, what would be one of the most um, impactful or, you know, devastating challenges that you had in your life where you had to, like, you didn't know what you were going to do next. You didn't know what tomorrow was going to be like. You didn't know, man, I just, I just, I'm, I'm unsure right now. Yeah. What would you share and talk about how, you know, what that was like for you and how you were able to, to pick yourself up and move forward to the next, to the next step? Yeah, no, thank you, Brad, for asking that question. Um, I can tell you that I think all of us go through something in life that if we look upon it, it's nothing more than a testimony from God. It's a testimony Mm -hmm. from God. And um, I do everything I can to share my testimony. Um, Several years ago, back, um, I was uh, on a business trip in San Francisco Mm -hmm. with some colleagues. And um, Diana, as you may recall, one of our colleagues, uh, she was with me on that trip. Diana's blowing up like crazy. Um, (laughs) Right. That's my sister. So uh, we were in San Francisco on business. And during our trip, I actually started getting sick. And I just I knew it wasn't normal. Something was not right. Mm. And um, it lasted for several days. And then um, my wife was there with me. Uh, She came up to visit. And then when we flew back, I felt fine. Uh, We flew back on a Saturday. And I think it was a Sunday Mm. morning. I woke up the very next morning and I collapsed right there on the steps. I collapsed and fell down the steps. And wow. my wife and kids saw me and we didn't know what was wrong. And we didn't have time to call an ambulance. My wife pushed me in the car and we drove straight to the hospital. And when I got to the wow. ER, they pulled me to the back immediately and they were running tests and running tests. And I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong? They started taking my clothes off and they said, sir, relax. You're having a heart attack. Here I am in my early thirties wow. and I'm being told that I'm having a heart attack. Wow. And that's when life hit me fast. I was like, what is going on far from my mind? And next thing I know, I was out and I didn't wake up for a couple of days later. They actually had me in an induced coma and kind of find out that I had caught um, two very weird um, kind of a disease. It was like um, a virus hit the inside of my heart and the outside of my heart. I was diagnosed with myocarditis and pyocarditis. Most people get maybe one or the other. I actually got both. And they still, to this day, cannot figure out what that virus was. And I sustained a little bit of damage to my heart. And my cardiologist, it took several weeks. I was in the hospital for a while. And then when I got out, I was on bed rest for some time. Um, The crazy thing is my cardiologist told me that he sees no more than maybe five cases a year. And out of that five, maybe one survives. And so I was that one. one. I was that one. And I bring that up because of the fact that at that moment, I remember looking in the hallway when I was in um, e- the ER and I saw my wife in the hallway crying and I thought mm. about my kids and I thought about my life and I was mm. like, what am I going to do or if I'm even going to be around? And so it was funny that when I got out and was back home, I realized the time of year was I had the fourth part of my CPA exam coming up in just a <laughs> few short weeks. And oh, that's no stress. No stress at all. there. <laughs> It's just normal everyday thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, right. <laughs> I was um, at that time, the CPA exam was only given twice a year, paper and mm-hmm. pencil. And you're in a big convention hall. And I was at the deadline. I had passed three of the four parts remaining and I had one part left. And have I not take that exam, I would have lost everything. Wow. And so I was mentally already saying to myself, I'm done with it. I'm not going. There's no way I didn't study for it. I'm prepared. And my wife told me, no, no. This is what mm-hmm. she has said we were going to do from the moment we met. You're going to do it. And mm-hmm. she, 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 
she was a cheerleader. She coached me up. And sure enough, I got myself up in bed, started studying and do what I can. It was things I never even knew, didn't study. And I went and took that exam. And on the day before everything was to expire, I got a notice in the mail saying that I passed. And my wife ran out of the house at the time. We didn't, you know, email wasn't the thing then. I pulled up in the driveway (laughs) and she came running outside and she said, you passed, you passed, you passed. And I literally was crying in my car. And I went outside in the front yard at night and I just looked up into the heavens and I just, Mm. oh God, thank you. Because it was nothing but Mm. God. And I actually had the highest score on that part of the exam than all the other parts that I took prior to. And so I want to say that in this journey, we're going to have obstacles. It's, it's, it's just inevitable. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to face things. You're going to even face people that will tell you, no, you can't do that. But right. you have to make a decision for yourself. Are you going to do it? And sometimes we even feel weak. And when we feel weak, we have to have those people around us who are going to coach us and pray for us and be with us and support us. Um, Again, I go back to when the night before Jesus knew that they were coming for him, he asked certain Mm. disciples to pray for him, to pray with him. Mm. So if if Jesus values relationships and people, then we should, too. And that's one of the things that will help you get through your obstacles in life. And for me, that was the perseverance. And um, if I can say what I've come to realize in life is no matter who you are, No matter where you are in life, regardless if you're young or old, if there's something you want for your life, if you see yourself doing something, visualize it, think about it. For me, all I thought about was getting that CPA certificate, that big certificate and hanging it on my wall. And that's what got me through so many obstacles is thinking about the end game. It's like running a race. You think about that finish line. Think about that finish line in everything you do in life. And that will push you forward. That will help you to make the right decisions. Am I going the right way? Am I veering off? If that doesn't get right. you to that finish line, then you know you need to get back on track. Indeed. And that's where perseverance Absolutely, comes man. in. Outstanding story, man. I, I do vaguely remember because I think we were working at the same company when mm-hmm. this happened. And I vaguely remember hearing about that. And I was in such shock. I'm like, Rob? Like, what the? I was like, what the? That was just totally. And I know it shocked you too and shocked the family as well. So, you know, one of the things that I hear you saying and 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 in and, and, and coaching people a lot of times people do have the vision of what they want right they mm-hmm. can see it out there in the future they see right. where they are and they can see okay i want to have that cpa plaque hanging on my wall one day mm-hmm. but what gets missed often rob is the strategy and the actions that are going to have to be taken to get to that plaque on the wall right Right. And you got to be clear about what that is. And you might make adjustments along the way. There's no it's, it's perfect. Right. right. You right. may make a Hey, You know, I thought this is the way I'm going to go, but I think actually this might be a better way to go. And you just listen, mm-hmm. be guided. Right. And just take the next action. Don't be afraid. You mentioned earlier uh, off camera about people are fearful. Right. And yes. letting fear get in the way. You know, yes. fear, fear is normal. It's a survival mechanism. Fear is perfectly normal. Courage is knowing that the fear is there and still being willing to take the action. Yes. That's courage. So That's courage great. can trump fear all day long, right? That's so great. man, dude, really great story. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, you've mentioned this this wonderful, amazing woman on a, on a, on a few occasions of this interview. You gotta give Nicole a shout out because she's the one that actually stood by you and said, hey, no, you gave your word that you're gonna do this. That's you great. are going That's to great. do this. And I'm going to make sure it gets done. Right. So and I'm sure with her and there's a lot of other supporters that you have, your mom, I'm sure. Talk about some of the people that have that have surrounded you and supported you in your in your rise to where you are today. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I I will tell you, um, my mother is a strong, strong black woman. Um, Mm. She didn't go to college. Um, You know, she didn't have the certificates, but she worked her butt off and she provided for me and my sibling and my brother, Gregory Fields. And. Mm -hmm. Through that, um, we persevered through life. We didn't have a car. There were times where we would, you know, we had to walk to the grocery store and walk back with our groceries in our hand. We Mm -hmm. did a lot. But my mother always made sure we were taken care of and and that we were proud of who we were and where we are going. And because of her, I know a lot of her is in me and that I have that fight because she fought. She was a strong woman and still to this day. 
Um, and then I was blessed to meet um, a, a beautiful woman along the way um, at a Birmingham airport. And um, we've been together for over 26, 27 years now. And wow. um, so Nicole has been a, a true blessing. And then um, we have three amazing, amazing children. Um, mm. um, my son, Trey, who you met a few times at a very young age. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's Robert the Third. We call him Trey. And um, right. he's a senior now at UGA um, studying finance. Wow. Very proud of him. Um, he nice. had a full ride, got the Zell Miller scholarship there, and he's just doing wonders. And then awesome, my man. daughter, Kayla. Um, Kayla is a sophomore at Kennesaw State University. Um, she's in the honors program studying to be a pediatric nurse practitioner. And then our youngest son, Carson, Carson with the K. He's a uh, oh. he's um, in high school right now, junior at okay. um, Hillgrove High School. And he's an amazing athlete and scholar himself. So awesome, I got a wonderful family. I've been really blessed with that. And then great friends and in, in, along the way. And um, and the one shout out I do want to give, if I may, is um, to a gentleman named Pablo Stanley. Pablo and I met when I was in the military and he and I were like-minded people and mm -hmm. together we became a really close bond and we fought and pushed each other through the obstacles that we had to face going through the military, going through college mm -hmm. and then even post college. And so um, I definitely have to say that again, the things that you talked about earlier with the obstacles. Yeah. Sometimes we don't know everything, but when you go out there and you find a good friend, or a mm -hmm. colleague, or you network, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay That's to right. find out and research. And and through that, he and I were able to to band together to get through a lot of obstacles. So I definitely want to say he had a huge impact on who I am. And of course, um, um, Philip and Gail Davenport were great inspiration to me. Those are Nicole's parents. And then awesome. I was when my father, Robert Fields, the original. <laughs> the OG. The, the OG. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give shots to the original. The original, That's and then awesome. my other brother and sister, and my my mother Kay. So I, I have a huge village. I've been blessed, brother. I've been blessed. That's awesome, bro. Awesome, man. You know, and, and I want to I want to take a moment to thank you, man, for your service. I know you you had experience with Desert Storm as well during that time when you were in the military. Yeah. So thank you for thank, thank you, you for having the courage to step up and uh, and do what you did to to keep us all safe on here on the on our on our in our home, man. So thank you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Well, brother, you are my, my pleasure, man. So, hey, you've been an inspiration to everybody in this interview, Rob, and I want to continue to allow people to be inspired by what you're up to, man, and follow you. So if someone wants to, hey, get connected with you, follow you, where can they find you on the social media uh, uh, strings out there and get connected with you? Thank you. Thank you for asking. I got some um, some big projects coming my way, so I'm looking forward to getting them out there right now. I can awesome. be found on LinkedIn, um, Robert Fields, CPA. Um, you'll see a lot of what I'm going to be pushing and doing right there. Um, awesome. And then also um, I can be reached at um, rfields at bishopfg.com. Awesome, man. Well, hey, I'd love to have you to come back on the podcast and talk about some of those projects at some point in the future, man. Love to see what you what you got going on, what you continue to be up to and the difference that you're continuing to make with other people, man. So thank you for all your contributions, Rob, man. You know, I got much love for you, brother. And uh, let's thank get you, together man. and, uh, you know, hang out, uh, hang out some time, man. It's not a plan. I know, you're, a hat. I know um, you're a big golf. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a big golf guy. You know, I don't know if I could. Well, I don't know what a big golf guy, but I know you like to play yeah. golf. But, you know, yeah, I like to putt putt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I like and I like to drive the cart. <laughs> so there you go. It's not a plan. Brother. Take All care. right, man. Take care, brother. Tell Nicole I said hello. I sure will. Take care. All right. Bye. All right, brother. Bye-bye. This is Doris Brown's baby boy. We out.